This webinar was recorded on January 28, 2022. ECACG hosts live webinars regularly. If you'd like to join these webinars, please visit our website at bcacg.com. For those of you who have just joined, my name is Kalina Kwan. I'm from BCACG, and thank you very much for joining us this morning. And the first person I would like to introduce you to is Amory. Um, Amory Copand um, is with the Networking for Nonprofit, who is the organization who bring us this webinar uh, this morning. So, Amory, I will flip over to you. Thanks, Kalina. Uh, Amory here from Networking for Nonprofits uh, Group in Cowichan. And uh, on behalf of my colleagues, uh, Rita, Carol Ann, myself, and Michelle, um, welcome all of you uh, to this annual presentation. We respectfully acknowledge the homelands of the indigenous peoples of this place we now call British Columbia and honor the many territorial keepers of the lands in which we live, work, play, and volunteer. My home base is of uh, Thetis Island and it's located in the traditional, ancestral, and unceded lands of the Lyaxon and Penalicate territories. I would like to take this time to also honor all of the empty seats in the room, past, present, and future. And so, again, thanks for attending. I'm going to pass the uh, mic over to Lori Portugal now for uh, greetings. Okay, good morning. It's um... We were just discussing how how long, how many times we had done this uh, this uh, particular webinar, and and this is about the seventh one, and we're very happy to see a large turnout, and uh, very very happy to be uh, able to uh, continue doing this on a year-to-year -year basis. Um, I'm president of Volunteer BC, and I'm also vice chair of BCACG. And um, and that's that's basically why I'm here. Glad to see the crowd, and I'm uh, and I appreciate the uh, acknowledgement that uh, Amory read out and uh, mentioned that um, Volunteer BC is based in R Richmond, and uh, and we have the uh, I guess pleasure of acknowledging the. Uh, the Tawasan, Kwantlen, and Nismasquian bands, and we are guests on their territory of the indigenous people in, in this land. And um, thank you very much for coming, and uh, let's have a good uh, session. And I'll pass it on to Denise. Thanks. Um, I'll just I'll just pause quickly in case there was anything Kalina wanted to say first, um, and then I assume I'll I'll be talking the rest of the time. No, I think that's okay. I'm just going to introduce you. So, um, okay. uh, <laughs> so um, Denise, I think some of you might have uh, um, met Denise before. Um, so Denise is from the uh, is the uh, policy and uh, outreach and policy manager of the um, community, BC Community Gaming Branch. And um, she will be uh, uh, doing the webinar for us today. And just to remind everybody, so we're in 2022, th this is actually the first webinar um, that is based on the 2022 uh, Community Gaming Grant uh, uh, guidelines. So um, I, I will pass it to Denise so we can get started. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and thanks for having me here today. Uh, it's nice to speak with you all, even though I can't see you. I know you're there. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, there will be an opportunity for questions at the end of the presentation. Um, so if you don't mind holding those questions until that point, you can put them in the chat box. Or you can raise your hand if you want to ask them um, using your voice. Um, we generally kind of hold them till the end because some of the time I can answer those questions as we go along. Um, so yeah, I'll, without much further ado, I will get started. I think all of us will turn our webcams off so you can have the full view of the slides. Um, and I believe that uh, the presentation as well as a recording of this presentation will be uh, available afterwards. So you don't need to worry about necessarily frantically taking notes or anything of that sort. Um, so yeah, I will just hide myself now and we will get started. All right. 
So uh, for today, the plan is really to go over the changes for what's new in the program that's uh, starting uh, up on February 1st. Um, as well as just a general overview of all the components of our program. Um, if you are already familiar with the program, this will be a good refresher. If it's totally new to you, it'll tell you everything that you hopefully need to know in order to apply for the grant. So yeah, we'll start off with the what's new for this year. We'll talk about the sort of essentials of the program, as well as eligibility criteria related to um, organization eligibility, program eligibility, and financial eligibility. We'll talk a bit about spending the grant, what you can spend it on, and the timeframes. We'll talk about the sort of nuts and bolts of how you actually apply for the grant. I'll spend a bit of time at the end talking about um, another separate grant program that we have, the Capital Project Grant. And then I'll finish off with some resources in case you need to get in touch with um, ourselves at the branch um, or with the BCACG or any of the community charitable gaming associations. So um, others have given their um, acknowledgement of the tradi traditional lands that they are on. Um, I myself am speaking to you today from Victoria, which is the unceded Coast Salish territory of the Lekwungen people, uh, known today as the Esquimalt and Songhees First Nations. Um, I recognize we're probably all coming from different places in the province, so um, we'll just take a moment for you to reflect on where you are currently viewing this presentation from today and whose traditional lands that you are on. Okay, so as I mentioned, we're going to kick off with the what's new. Um, and uh, if you are familiar with our program, uh, you'll you'll know what's different than before. Um, otherwise, this is kind of just a highlight of some of the things that we have uh, made tweaks or adjustments to. So as some of you may know, uh, we do update our guidelines every year in response to the feedback and input that we receive throughout the year um, and in response to things that may arise that we need to take a closer look at. Um, and this comes from stakeholders, from our applicants, and even from our staff. So the changes to our guidelines this year, we've kind of grouped them into three categories. Um, the first is extending those temporary policy changes that are intended to support uh, COVID-19 restart and recovery. We've got a couple new policy initiatives for the year, um, as well as minor changes and clarification to existing policy. So I'll talk about the COVID-19 uh, response measures first. Um, many of these are carried over. So if you were familiar with them last year, there's really not much difference this year. Um, but since the start of the pandemic, uh, we've adapted our policies and procedures and we are continuing these again for the, the coming grant year. So what this looks like um, is that we are continuing to open up the human and social services sector a few months early. Um, in June. I will note though that this is the last year that we will be offering that earlier opening. So starting next, next year, so not, not starting February 1st, but February 1st of 2023, um, that will transition back to the regular intake of August 1st. So just a little bit of a heads up on that. Um, we have continued to relax the operating surplus criteria for return applicants, as well as the 75% government funding limit for programs. We have also continued to relax the 12 month program delivery requirement for return applicants whose programming was affected by COVID-19. Um, so for example, if your programming was postponed or disruption uh, or disrupted uh, due to uh, public health restrictions or anything like that, um, and for a second year, we've continued to allow funding to be used to create uh, new paid positions, and hopefully this will help um, organizations to retain the people that they need um, and increase their capacity. So on the new policy initiative side, we have a couple of different things that we're introducing this year. Um, the first one is to allow organizational costs up to 15% of the grant. So the eligible use of funds has been changed to allow for a maximum of 15% of an organization's total community gaming grant toward organizational costs. Um, and these costs do not need to be related to the direct delivery of the program. So previously funding could only be used for costs uh, related to the direct delivery of programs. 
um, and operating costs that weren't directly related to program delivery weren't allowed. Um, so this change will provide a bit more flexibility uh, for organizations to direct funds where they're most needed. Um, I'm gonna talk a bit more about this later on when we talk about the use of grant funds, so uh, more details to come on that. The other is uh, that we will consider new programs that have been delivered for less than 12 months uh, for funding. So last year we did waive that 12 month delivery requirement for new programs that were responding to COVID-19 related needs. And we've heard feedback um, that organizations need to continue to be nimble and adjust their programming, not only due to COVID-19, but just in response to other community feedback and to not stay static. So this year, um, programs that have been delivered for less than 12 months may be eligible for funding. Um, and this is part of a new pilot for our grant program. So um, applicants must demonstrate capacity to deliver the new program in addition to meeting all the other regular eligibility criteria. And again, I'll touch more on the requirements for these new programs um, when we talk a bit about the program eligibility um, later in the presentation. And finally, uh, for the sort of minor policy changes and clarifications, um, we've updated to just make those improvements. Um, some examples of what that looks like uh, is that we've updated our organization eligibility criteria to provide greater clarity on eligible organizations. Um, in particular, we've specified that the organization's primary purpose is to operate for community benefit and that professional industry or religious institutions are not eligible organizations. Um, and this clarification was added just to ensure that funds are directed to organizations that are open and accessible to all British Columbians. We, <clears throat> excuse me, we have also increased the amount of time that restricted funds are accepted from three years to five years for funds that are uh, really intended for specific purposes or a project. Um, and from five years to seven years for uh, bigger capital projects. I know many organizations have expressed difficulties concerning this criteria, um, particularly from COVID-19, um, you know, an inability to raise uh, funds for specific projects, um, delays to projects and purchases from things like supply chain issues. Um, so the hope that this additional time will help. Um, and we've also added clarification that Funds will be restricted prior to the fiscal year end, or that they must be restricted, I should say, um, and that they must not be restricted with the sole intention to meet the uh, program financial eligibility criteria. So in other words, to reduce the organization's surplus. And finally, we have removed the $250,000 limit on net revenue that's earned by organizations through their own licensed gambling activities. So this will no longer be a factor in an organization's financial eligibility um, and organizations can fundraise up to any amount um, through licensed gaming activities like 50-50s, um, raffles, and so on. So that's about the measure of it. Of course, um, all of this is contained in our program guidelines, um, as well as everything that we're gonna go over today. Um, and as I always say, it's always good practice, even if you are familiar, to take a read through um, as you prepare uh, and submit your application. And this is on our website. So program essentials. So um, as probably many of you know, uh, this program has $140 million uh, that we provide annually. Uh, this comes from commercial gaming revenues. So the way that we have split it out is that we have 135 million for our community gaming grant program, um, and that's to help not-for-profits deliver their ongoing programs in their community. And we also have a separate $5 million capital project grant program that's going to help not-for-profits specifically with capital projects or acquisitions of a larger size. And we'll talk about that program at the very end here. So one important feature of our program is that it is not competitive. Uh, all eligible not-for-profits who apply will receive funding. And what that normally looks like for us is that over 90% of applicants will receive a grant. Um, last year, well, the year that was 
not just finishing up right now. We're not quite through um, assessing all the applications for the, the current year. Um, but the one before that, the average grant amount was over 25,000. Um, and I'll just note that there is no minimum grant amount that people can apply for. Um, so we give out quite small grants all the way up to quite large grants. Um, and I think this average reflects that the majority of programming um, is happening at that local community level. And what that means is that we have been able to fund about 5,000 organizations across BC on average every year. So we have a, a bunch of different sectors that can apply for our program. Um, obviously, there are many different types of programming that take place across the province. So we have separated it out into six different sectors. Um, I'll just talk a little bit about each one to give you a sense of what um, each of these are about. So arts and culture, um, this is a stream that's really about providing public access to and preservation of the arts, heritage or culture. So this can include programs like um, performing arts education, music education, uh, art galleries, fairs, uh, museums, as well as cultural programs and festivals. We have our sports sector, um, and that is focused on community-based or amateur programs, um, really around uh, organized competitive physical activity. And that's for both you, uh, youth and adult sports. Um, so any type of sport that you can imagine, really. Um, it, and it also includes uh, Special Olympics and seniors games. In the environment sector, um, this is for programs that are focused on the revitalization, protection, um, and education on ecosystems and the environment. So some examples would include things like ecosystem conservation, land stewardship, um, outdoor education, climate change, uh, as well as the protection of domestic animals or wildlife. So um, animal rehabilitation centers or shelters would also fall under this sector. Uh, and then we've also got public safety. That is about programs that enhance and support public safety initiatives. Uh, so we fund um, volunteer firefighting programs, search and rescue, uh, as well as outdoor recreation, um, and disaster relief and emergency preparedness. And then we've got our human and social services sector. It's our largest sector, um, primarily because it encompasses quite a lot of things. Um, but generally speaking, we kind of summarize that by saying it's about programs that significantly contribute to the quality of life in a community or a group. So some of the things that we fund under this sector would be things like childcare, um, services for people with disabilities or uh, mental health issues. Um, we do uh, education and outreach programming, community building programs, uh, seniors activities, as well as uh, service clubs. And finally, we have a separate stream for parent advisory councils and district parent advisory councils. And that is specifically to support the enhancement of extracurricular opportunities for kids in the K-12 school system. And we fund that one a little bit differently. Uh, it's based on previous year's enrollment um, and we provide $20 per student to the parent advisory council. So funding levels, um, they vary depending on the size and scope of an organization, but typically uh, they kind of fall into three buckets. So for an organization that is focused on serving its local area, they are eligible for up to $100,000. Um, organizations that serve more of a, a region, so more than just one community, would be eligible for up to $225,000. And an organization that has a provincial reach and scope uh, would be eligible for up to $250,000. Um, as I mentioned, funding is awarded based on the size, scope, and community benefit. Um, that's been demonstrated through the program description, as well as the demonstrated financial need that we see through the program financials and budget that's provided. Um, that provides information on the previous 12 months of uh, the program's delivery. Um, another factor in the funding request um, is obviously how much the organization asks for. Um, we wouldn't fund more than what has been asked for. 
Um, but our, our main advice is always to ask for what you need um, that is demonstrated through your program financials and, and what it takes to run your program. And the last thing I'll note is that uh, because we do fund um, all eligible organizations, we are a demand-driven program. And we do have a fixed budget of that 135 million that I mentioned earlier. So the amount of funding that we have available to disperse every year is carefully managed to ensure that we can support all of the eligible organizations that um, request funding. So this means that funding levels are not guaranteed from year to year. So now I'll talk about uh, organization eligibility and some aspects around that. So uh, as we've been talking about, this is a grant program for not-for-profits. So the number one criteria to be eligible is that you are a not-for-profit. Um, the primary purpose of the organization to, should be to operate for community benefit. Um, the organization must be delivering programs and services to their community. Uh, they must have an open membership, so anyone with an interest uh, in joining and benefiting can do so. Um, there is a volunteer board in place and a voting membership that selects that volunteer board. And we're looking to see here that there is more than double the number of voting members to board members. Um, as I mentioned, that, that board is democratically chosen um, and at least two thirds of them reside in BC and the board members are not receiving remuneration for their role um, on the board. So an organization would be ineligible um, if it were a for-profit organization or a member-funded society. Um, any sort of political party, political action group or lobbyist group um, is not eligible for a grant, nor is any level of government um, or government operated facility like a healthcare facility, um, education institution, library, museum, and so on. Um, professional or industry associations are also not eligible, um, as are uh, religious institutions. And I'll just make a little point about the, the last one there. So while religious institutions um, certainly operate as not pro non-profits, um, in the sense that they're not generating a profit and they do operate for community benefit, um, they're generally not eligible by default as they don't have those things I mentioned previously, like a board of directors or a voting membership. Um, quite in the same way that, um, uh, you know, an, an organized not-for-profit does. Um, however, um, non-profit organizations that are affiliated with a religious institution are LD requirements. So now I'll go into program eligibility. So our program supports a wide range of programs across all of the different sectors, um, and we have the same program eligibility for um, each of those sectors. Um, we fund on a program basis, which means that we fund, uh, we provide funding for specific programs. Um, and the way that we define a program is that it is a ongoing service activity or series of activities. Um, our program is focused on supporting programs that uh, benefit the whole community, respond to a community's needs and are accessible and open to all community members. And we fund programs that are already ongoing in a community. So our normal criteria is that programs must be delivered for at least 12 months before they're eligible for funding. Um, as I mentioned at the start, that criteria is relaxed again for 2022 for return applicants whose programming has been affected. But in addition, um, also as I mentioned at the start, um, starting this year, our program will consider new programs that have been operating for less than 12 months. So um, applicants must meet all other eligibility criteria, and they also must demonstrate that they do have the capacity to deliver that new program. So we would be looking for things like um, how the program is meeting an identified need in the community, uh, how the program will be delivered on an ongoing basis. So again, like pilots, projects, one-time events uh, would not be considered. Um, as well as looking at how the program demonstrate feasibility, that it will continue to operate um, and demonstrating that the program is, is currently in operation, even though it hasn't been for over 12 months. 
So um, some other aspects about eligible programs. Um, as I mentioned, generally speaking, we do have this criteria of having been delivered for 12 months, but uh, I just talked about some exceptions to that, particularly COVID disruptions um, and uh, consideration for new programs that have been delivered, but not quite for 12 months just yet. Um, the programs must be directly delivered by the applicant who's requesting funding. Um, the, the, it must be uh, an ongoing uh, program, and so we're not looking to fund projects. Um, it must provide a immediate and direct service to the community. And in addition, all programs are accessible and inclusive to all those who have a, an interest in participating or benefiting. So how does an organization apply for a program? Um, there are two examples. I've got this one that's fairly straightforward uh, where the organization delivers just one program and all the activities that they do um, fall under that uh, umbrella of that program. So we've got the Sunshine Theater Society here. They're a not-for-profit. They run the Sunshine Theater program. Um, and everything that this organization does is related to this program. Uh, so any of their seasonal production costs, um, any promotion and advertising, all, all of those things are wrapped up under this program. And then we have another example where there are multiple programs. Um, so as you can see, they're all quite discreet. Um, they may all have different revenue sources and expenses, um, and they're all kind of focused on something slightly different. So uh, in this example, we've got the Sunshine Arts Council. They've got three programs. The first is a public art display and gallery program. The second is a summer folk music festival. And the third is a youth art lessons and kids camps. So uh, the organization can apply for all three of these programs within the same application. Um, and each program would require a separate program description to describe what that, what that program is all about. Um, as well as program financials that are specific to each of those programs. And we'll talk a bit more about that uh, shortly. So on the other side of the coin, um, things that would make a program ineligible would be if the program was exclusively serving an organization's membership and uh, the programs were not open to the public or, or reasonably able to be um, accessed by the public. Uh, programs that are focused on providing financial assistance to individuals are not eligible, um, as are fundraising programs or social enterprise programs. Uh, programs that are really about just solely operating a facility or a venue uh, would also not be eligible for funding. Um, vocational training programs are not eligible, um, as are programs delivered on contract or under a funding agreement with uh, another organization. Um, programs that primarily benefit other organizations um, as opposed to the general public are not eligible. And really any program that doesn't deliver an immediate and direct service to the community um, would not be eligible. Um, as I've said probably a few times now, the emphasis is really on the delivery of programming to individuals in the community. So as part of the application, um, organizations are required to submit a program description for each program that they are applying for funding for. Um, this description should be a summary of all the core information that someone would need to know um, and what your program is and, and what it's all about. Um, so things like, you know, what is it that you do? How many people benefit? which types of people or who, who's being served, um, when and how often the program happens, where it happens, um, and how the program reflects and meets the community's needs. So this is really the place where you tell us all of those kind of hard facts in terms of the who, what, where, why, how, um, but it's also where you can tell us about the, the sort of storytelling side. Um, why your program is needed, the gap that it fills, um, why it's important to your community, and some of the great outcomes that it achieves. 
Um, and the other thing I'll mention is that this description should really tell us about the activities that took place in the last 12 months, because um, that's really what we're, we're assessing in order to make that funding determination. Um, you can certainly tell us about um, things you have planned coming up, but uh, I will stress that it is important to, to tell us about the picture of the last 12 months. Um, I mentioned that we are considering these new programs. So obviously what I just said about telling us about the last 12 months, you won't have a full 12 months. Um, so for programs that haven't been delivered for that time period, um, the program description should still address all of those relevant aspects, um, both what they have accomplished so far, but what is planned for the first 12 months of operation. Um, and also include information that demonstrates a viable program plan for that ongoing delivery of the program. Um, tell us a bit about you know, the organization's capacity to deliver the program um, and how it is meeting an identified need within the community. Uh, before I move on, I've, I kind of mentioned this briefly when we talked about the sectors, but there are two different kinds of programming that um, the Community Gaming Grant different to um, some other types of organization programming that we've talked about so far. Um, I mentioned that we fund service clubs, so organizations like um, the Elks, Kiwanis, Lions, and so, are, so forth. Um, they actually can apply for a community donations program in addition to other programming that they may uh, run. And that's to donate funds to other eligible organizations um, or individuals or families who are facing uh, a one-time emergency. And there's a separate chapter in our guidelines specific to these organizations. And then I mentioned earlier too, we do have um, the Parent Advisory Council sector. Um, as I mentioned, that is funded at a rate of $20 per student, and that's intended for extracurricular activities um, for kids uh, in the K-12 school system. And we have a whole separate other guidelines document for that. We're just working on updates to that right now. Um, so that will be released in the next couple of months. So financial eligibility. Um, we do have financial criteria for both the organization as well as the programs that are being applied for. Um, so organization level financial statements are what we look at to determine whether the organization has a financial need, um, because obviously we want to ensure that our grant funding is going toward organizations who can demonstrate that they have a need for financial support. So we require the following documents in order to assess that revenue and expense statement for the, the previous fiscal year. So the one that's most recently completed has the full 12 months. We also are looking for a balance sheet for that same time period. And we're looking for an organization budget for the current fiscal year. So we can see kind of the events and activities that may be planned um, for what's coming up. Um, any accompanying notes to the financial statements for the previous fiscal year would be required. It's obviously that'll help us to interpret anything that needs more explanation. Um, and for organizations that are applying for programs that have been operating for less than 12 months, um, who are also an organization that has been operating for less than 12 months, um, we do have a slightly revised list of financial documents, again, noting that they won't have things like a complete 12 months of revenue and expenses or a balance sheet. Um, so what that looks like is, um, will be a revenue and expense statement for the year to date. Um, a statement of financial position or any other type of relevant documentation on the organization's assets and liabilities for the year to date. Uh, we would be looking for um, organization budget for the current fiscal year as well as the next fiscal year so we can see that long-term plan. Uh, an organization would be temporarily ineligible to receive a grant if it exhibited any conditions that cast significant doubt on its financial stability, or if it has more than 50% of its previous fiscal year's operating expenses on hand in unrestricted funds at the start of its current fiscal year. And I'll talk a bit more about this in a second. Um, and you may note that this was one of those criteria that I mentioned at the very start that will not be enforced for return applicants who uh, have been affected by COVID-19. And this is the, I guess, third year now that we've 
have that in place. So the surplus calculation, um, the branch determines that financial need that we talked about um, by assessing the cash on hand that's proportionate to an organization's expenses. And we call this the surplus calculation. Uh, so how do we calculate this surplus calculation? Um, basically, we subtract any gaming funds, liabilities or restricted funds from an organization's current assets um, and we assess this against the organization's operating expenses and that comes up with a surplus percentage. You can kind of see it on the screen here. Um, you do not need to do this calculation. The analyst does this um, as they're assessing their your application um, and it's based off of the information that has been provided through those financial statements that you have um, given as part of your application. Um, as I mentioned, this criteria is flexible for those who have been affected by COVID-19, so we uh, haven't been enforcing that uh, for those who have been impacted and maybe their surplus calculation is higher than normal uh, due to maybe loans um, or any sort of financial aid that they've received from various levels of government um, to assist through the pandemic. So program financial eligibility, um, as I mentioned, we have the organization financial eligibility. We also have uh, financial eligibility that is related to the programs. Um, we're also looking to see program financials to uh, determine the, the financial need of that particular program. So what we look for there is quite similar, a program and revenue expense statement for the previous fiscal year that's specific to that program. And we're also looking for a program budget for the current fiscal year uh, for each of the programs that you apply for. So if you think back to that earlier example, if you have several different programs, we would be looking for those documents for each of the programs that you apply for. Um, so for new programs, uh, those who have been operating for less than 12 months, um, we are looking for similar documents. Um, but obviously, if they haven't been delivered for 12 months at the time of application, it's going to be slightly different again. So for those programs, we would be looking for a program revenue and expense statement for the year to date. We would be looking for program budgets for the current fiscal year as well as the next fiscal year. Again, this gives us that picture into the future. Um, and budgets must indicate which revenue sources uh, may be confirmed or proposed and clearly identify each source of provincial or federal government funding, um, including any contract or grant monies. And that's not really different than normal. We, we like to see all of those revenue sources clearly identified. So nothing really different there. Um, one of the program financial uh, criteria that we have is that government funding can't exceed 75% of the total program cost. Um, and one of the reasons for that is that we, we want to see that demonstrated community support for the program. So applicants must have at least 25% of their program operating costs coming from non-government sources. Um, and this can be achieved uh, a bunch of different ways, um, not, uh, not exclusively, but uh, user fees, fundraising, um, in-kind contributions, and so on. And if government funding exceeds that 75% threshold, funding may be limited or denied. And again, a uh, caveat here, as you probably recall, this criteria is not being enforced for return applicants who have been affected by COVID-19. Uh, for all the same reasons um, as everything else, your, your program financials may be a little bit atypical um, due to um, funds not being spent, um, you know, revenues not coming in, Maybe you've received some financial support, so we're, we're not enforcing that for return applicants. Um, and uh, yeah, as I mentioned, all sources of program revenue must be clearly stated in the program financial documents. So I've mentioned several uh, financial documents so far, so we'll just kind of pause here for a bit of a summary. Um, on the organization financial side, we are looking to see the organization's balance sheet for the most recently completed fiscal year, the organization's revenue and expense statement for the most recently completed fiscal year, uh, and the organization's budget for the current fiscal year. 
and on the program side, for each program that an organization applies for, we're looking to see the program revenue and expense statement for the most recently completed fiscal year, a program budget for the current fiscal year, um, and a program in-kind contribution summary, if applicable. And that would be related, again, to the most recently completed fiscal year. I'm gonna talk a bit more about that in a second. Um, but basically, this is if an organization is claiming in-kind support as part of their program revenues. Um, and I'll just also mention here that our website has examples of all of these financial documents. Um, they're a really great resource if you know you want to see what that looks like or you want to check the formatting of yours against our example. Um, definitely take a look at those. And I'll just note again that if you are applying for a program that has been delivered for less than 12 months or you're an organization who has been in operation for less than 12 months who's got one of those new programs, um, your financial document requirements are slightly different. Um, and I would just point you toward the relevant sections of the guidelines for more information on those requirements. So we just briefly introduced this uh, in the last slide. Um, so organizations can include in-kind support or contributions as part of their program financials. Um, it's a great way to show that community support and investment that I talked about. Um, but these contributions can also be a way to show um, a larger program revenue and expenses that's related to the programs and support your requests for funding. And it can also really help if organizations are finding that that government funding is making up a large portion of their revenue um, and particularly helps groups that may not have uh, many other different funding sources. So, in-kind support can include any combination of volunteer time, um, donated labor, equipment, services, um, and materials um, over the past 12 months. Um, the way that we sort of value the volunteerism and donation follows these, these standards for our program. So for donated materials, they would be valued at their verified fair market value. So if you were to have gone out and purchased them, that's what it would have cost. Uh, for any donated accredited professional services, so things like an accountant or bookkeeper, that would also be valued at their verified fair market rate. So if you were to go out and have to pay for that, they would charge X amount of dollars an hour. You could use that as your in-kind contribution amount. Um, and just general volunteer labor is valued um, at up to $20 per hour. And I'll just note that that $20 an hour rate is only for the purpose of calculating in-kind uh, volunteer contributions um, for our specific program. So um, if you're applying for other grant programs, uh, you'd have to check with them on how they want you to, to evaluate um, that volunteer contribution. Um, I'll note too, if you do include any in-kind contributions in your program fin financials, uh, to list it both as a revenue and expense so that the amount uh, will balance to zero. And we request that information on your program's in-kind support be submitted using our in-kind contribution summary, um, which can be found on our website. And that really helps us to determine those eligible costs, um, i.e. those that are uh, related to the program delivery. Um, and I'll just also mention too, like not that this is any different than anything else, but your complete records of all of the volunteer hours and donated services or materials must be retained as part of your gaming records. So I've talked a bit about, um, you know, current fiscal year, the most recently completed fiscal year. Um, and obviously there are different sectors with different intakes. So the timing of your fiscal year and application and what financial documents that you would be submitting are, are probably going to vary. So I'm going to run through a couple of examples that will hopefully paint the picture of what that means for your organization in terms of your fiscal year, um, as well as when you are planning on applying. So I'm going to use the arts and culture intake as an example. They are the first one coming up. Uh, their intake runs from February 1st to April 30th, so they've got a three-month intake window. And in this example, the organization's fiscal year uh, runs the calendar year, so January 1st to December 31st. 
And this organization has decided that they want to apply on April 1st of 2022. So using those dates as markers, um, the program actuals and the organ organization actuals uh, revenue and expense statement would be for the most recently completed fiscal year, which would be January 1st to December 31st of 2021 in this example. And I'll just note, um, you know, the fiscal year ended a couple months ago at this point. Um, if the finalized uh, financial statements are not ready, organizations can submit draft or internally prepared financial statements, but it does need to be for that time period that is referenced here. As for the budget for the organization and the program, that should be for the current fiscal year. So that would be January 1st to December 31st of 2022. So another example um, where we were still in the arts and culture intake, uh, this example, the organization's fiscal year is different. So a lot of um, organizations follow the April 1st to March 31st fiscal year format. Um, this organization is still deciding to apply on April 1st, which as you'll note is the day after their fiscal year has ended. So what they would be providing um, is the organization and program uh, revenue and expense statements for the period of April 1st, 2021 to March 31st of 2022. So as I mentioned, the fiscal year has literally just closed um, but it is the most recently complete fiscal year. So it is the reference year that is required. Again, um, internal or draft financials um, can be submitted if the financials aren't, aren't ready, or the organization could wait a few weeks to apply if it's gonna take them some time to put it together. Um, or alternatively, they can apply before that March 31st um, deadline. So they'd be in a totally different fiscal year. And, and I'll talk about that example next, but just to say there are ways of timing the application that can work better for your organization in terms of the documentation that may be required. And again, uh, the organization program and, and program budget um, would be for the current fiscal year, which is April 1st of 2022 uh, to March of 2023. So here is another example. Again, we're using the same fiscal year of April 1st to March 31st. Um, this organization has decided, you know what, we're going to apply a bit earlier. So they're applying March 1st. Uh, as you'll note, that's earlier uh, in the intake and it's at the end of the fiscal year um, versus the start of the fiscal year as uh, was shown in the previous example. So what we see here is that the organization and program actuals are for the period of April 1st of 2020 to March 31st of 2021, um, because that is the most recently completed fiscal year. Um, as we're still in the 2021-2022 uh, fiscal year, which ends um, at the end of March. Um, as for the organization and program budget, um, ideally, this would still be for that April 1st of 2022 to March of 2023 period. Um, although you're still in that current fiscal year uh, that ends um, in March uh, 31st of 2022, there's really only a month left. Um, so assuming that you intend to spend your grant for future expenses, um, that budget should really show that, that future planned program budget. So hopefully that gives a couple of examples of how you can look at um, both your organization's fiscal year as well as the time period that you have to apply for your particular sector and you can work out maybe what um, is most advantageous for you um, to, to prepare those documents. So we'll talk about spending the grant. Um, for those that are familiar with the program, uh, you will recall that in the past, grant funds could only be used toward costs that are essential to the direct delivery of an approved program. Um, organizations could prorate some of those um, quote unquote organizational costs to a program uh, so long as they were related um, and necessary for the delivery of that program. So things like rent costs or wages um, and costs that were unrelated to the program were not eligible. 
Beginning this year, um, organizations may use up to 15% of their total grant funds toward organization operational costs. And I'll discuss this more in a few slides. As for program costs, these eligible costs have not changed. So that includes things like wages of paid positions for program staff, um, rent, utilities, and insurance for the program, um, any supplies like office supplies, um, internet or phone costs, program advertising costs, things like that, that's eligible. The rental or purchase of equipment that's needed to deliver your program, also eligible. Um, as well as travel that is essential to deliver the program uh, within BC. Um, some out of province travel may also be eligible, although I will note that there's a, uh, a pre-approval process that an organization would need to go through to um, have permission to spend their grant funds on that. Um, and that's treated slightly separately. Um, so you can continue to prorate organizational costs toward your program like before. Um, again, so long as they are directly related to the program delivery. And, and here's an example of how that works. Um, so we've got an employee here who spends 40% of their time working on an eligible program. We call this a museum display program. And the other 60% of the time, they're working on either non-eligible programs or organizational duties, um, such as a gift shop, grant writing, board work, and so on. So in this case, uh, under that program, they can include up to 40% of the employee's wage as a expense. So they can attribute some of that person's wage to that program. Here's a, a bit more of a complicated example. Um, if you have uh, multiple programs and a, a, co a cost or expense that's shared across all those programs. So um, in this example here, we've got the Sunshine Art Council again. We've got an organization's director who spends time on four programs in addition to just their organizational core duties. Um, see one of these programs are not eligible under the Community Gaming Grant as it's a program that's focused on fundraising for the organization. However, the other three are approved programs. And in this case, the director spends an equal amount of time on all five of these activities. So essentially 20% of their time uh, is spent on each of those five buckets. So in this case, 20% uh, of the director's wage can be included as an expense in each of the program budgets for those three approved programs, the art gallery program, the summer music festival program, and the youth art program. Um, this same principle applies to any other core costs related to that program. So things like rent, utility wages, supplies, insurance, advertising, and so on. So, um, as I mentioned, new for this year, organizations can use up to 15% of their total grant amount toward organizational costs. Uh, and these costs do not need to be related to the direct delivery of the program. So some eligible costs could include uh, wages of paid positions um, that are not related to programs, uh, rent, utilities, and insurance, again, not related to the program. Um, any office supplies or, or general IT costs that are just about the organization. Any professional memberships, um, say you need to um, have a membership to a particular industry association, um, that would be considered an organizational cost that would be eligible. Um, if you pay for any financial management costs like bookkeeping or accounting, that is more about the, the organization. Again, that would be eligible. Um, any legal costs or any translation costs or, or things of that nature um, would now be an eligible use of grant funds. So uh, returning again to our previous example, um, what we're showing here is that core costs that are not directly associated with a program, um, things like administration costs, professional fees, financial management costs, etc., cetera, um, they are now eligible and organizations can use up to 15% of your grant toward those costs. Um, I'll just note though, organization costs that are associated with a pro, uh, program can still be prorated. 
So using that previous example, um, as we mentioned, 20% of the director's wages can still be prorated to each of those three eligible programs. So you're still able to use grant funds toward that like normal. And 20% uh, of the wages for that uh, director's time that was spent on organizational duties can also be paid for using grant funds now. You'll see that uh, on the left-hand side of the screen there. So if your organization decides to use uh, the allowed 15% of your total grant funds toward the organizational cost, there's a number of different ways that you can decide how, to, how you wanna allocate those funds. Um, there's a couple of scenarios here I'll just run through. Um, in the first, an organization might decide that they wanna take the maximum of 15% for each of the programs that they receive funding for. So uh, we've got program A that's been awarded 5,000, program B also has been awarded 5,000. So that organization's total community gaming grant is $10,000. So taking 15% of that total amount is $1,500. And if they wanted to sort of take that off the top of each of their programs, uh, essentially, it would be that $5,000 minus 15%, which leaves program A with uh, $4,250, um, similarly with program B. Um, and then they also have that $1,500 to spend toward their organizational costs. Um, the same principle would apply if an organization wanted to take a lesser percentage. So say in scenario one, they wanted to take 10% instead of 15%. The same logic would apply. So you don't need to take the whole 15% if, if that's not what you actually need. Um, or in scenario two, an organization may decide to take the allowed percentage from a specific program and, and leave another one alone. So uh, this one here, again, program A and B have both been awarded $5,000 each. The organization has a total community gaming grant of $10,000. And the same math, so 15% that they are allowed to take uh, equals $1,500. So in this case, um, they've decided that they want to take the total allowable amount from program A, so $1,500 from program A, which is going to leave program A with uh, $3,500 toward uh, costs related to that program. And program B is still intact. They still have that $5,000 to apply toward that program. And in addition to that, they've now got $1,500 to apply toward organizational costs. And same thing, uh, similar principle, if an organization wanted to split up the percentage, so say they wanted to take 10% of that total allowable grant um, from program A and 5% um, from program B, um, really, you know, the, the kind of way to work backwards is to figure out what is the maximum amount that you are allowed to take based on that 15% and then figure out um, where you want to take that from the uh, program funding that you've been awarded. Um, so it's, you know, underscoring, you know, it's really up to you how you want to do this. Um, the important thing is to determine that maximum and how to apply that to your situation and your needs. So where do organizations reflect how they've allocated their grant funds toward organizational costs? Um, the first thing I wanna mention is that funding amounts are still determined the same way as they always have been before. Um, it is based on the size and scope of your programming that we see through program financials and your program description. So additional funding is not being added toward grant amounts for the purpose of supporting organizational costs. It's just being given as an option if that's what you would like to do with some of that grant funding. Um, the option to use grant funds uh, toward operational costs is really just intended to support the needs of your organization and to provide a little more flexibility. So you may have one very strong program that's bringing in a lot of revenues and you decide to take a portion of funds um, intended toward this program to support your organization. Or you may decide that your programs really need 100% of the grant funding that's been allocated toward it and decide not to use any of the portion um, up to that 15%. It's totally up to you. Um, and decisions on whether and how to allocate funds um, toward your operational costs 
do not need to be made at the time of application. Um, it's simply just being given as an option for how you might spend your grant funds. So you don't need to figure that out ahead of time. Um, it's something you can decide once you receive your grant and, and where you're currently at at that point in time. So how do organizations reflect their allocation of funds toward um, organization operational costs? Um, as I mentioned um, on the current application, um, if you already know what you'd like to do, you can certainly indicate that in the use of funds sections on the application. Um, and you can say how much of the requested grant amount would be used to support those organizational costs and what those costs might be. This is totally optional, um, but if you already know, um, you can definitely reflect that there. On a future application, so if you decide, if you get grant funding this year, um, you decide to use grant funding toward those organizational costs. Um, where we would see that show up is in your program actuals for next year. So you would reflect the actual amount of the grant that was used toward your program. Um, for example, uh, in the previous example there, we had um, an organization whose program had received 5,000, but they decided to only use uh, 52, or sorry, 4,250 toward that program the CGG funds would show that amount, not what you were awarded, but what you actually use. Um, and just to be perfectly clear, your program actuals for the application you submit in 2022 will be the same as normal. Um, if you receive funding uh, with this current grant year and you decide to use funds for organizational costs, you would reflect that in your program actual, actuals for the 2023 application. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, and finally, uh, for reporting, uh, we have added a new section to the gaming account summary report uh, where you can report on the percentage of funding that you decided to use for your organizational costs. Um, here, we're just asking you to indicate the total percentage of the grant used toward organizational costs. Um, you would report on the items that you spent funding on in the disbursement list as you normally would. Um, you might find it helpful to separate out the program costs from the organizational costs, but that's totally up to you. Um, and again, I'll just note that this new section will only apply to funding that's received for applications that were submitted in 2022, um, not for funding that was received from 2021 or earlier. So it's a, a kind of a going forward type thing. Okay, so in addition uh, to funding for your program to support the ongoing costs, um, you can also apply for funding for minor capital projects or capital acquisitions. Um, for the minor capital project side, uh, you can apply for capital projects uh, that are under $20,000 in value. Uh, they must be essential for the delivery of an approved program. Um, some examples would be uh, if you needed to install a wheelchair ramp or do a small renovation um, to where you're hosting your programs, that would be something considered um, under a capital, minor capital project. The other is capital acquisitions. So these would be smaller acquisitions that are required for you to deliver your approved program. We do require quotes if it is over $5,000 total. Um, this would be for things like one-off purchases, like computers, um, other specialized equipment or vehicles. And I'll just note that you can't apply for just a minor capital project or acquisition only. Um, it needs to be included as part of the funding request for one of your programs. Um, so you'd have uh, your ongoing programming costs. And in addition to that, you'd have um, a minor capital project request or a capital um, acquisition request. So spending rules, um, organizations must have a separate account for receiving, holding, and spending the gaming funds uh, because all grant funds are deposited into this gaming account. Um, all eligible expenses should be paid directly from the gaming account. Uh, you may transfer either by check or electronically from your gaming account to your general or your operating account to reimburse um, eligible program expenses that have been paid out of your, your other accounts. Um, but we do uh, suggest as a best practice to try and do all of this through your gaming account. 
Um, payment can be done by check or board approved electronic transfer. And of course, documentation like invoices and receipts must be retained with the gaming records for five years. And the time frame to spend funds, um, grant funds must be spent within 12 months of receiving them. Uh, funding can also be used for costs that were incurred in the same fiscal year that the grant was received. So, for example, um, if your organization's fiscal year ran from January 1st to December 31st of 2022, and you received a grant on April 1st of 2022, you could either spend your grant uh, forward for the next 12 months, which would take you up to April 1st of 2023, or you could spend it backwards uh, to the beginning of your fiscal year, which started in January, uh, January 1st. Um, so costs essentially uh, incurred between January 1st and March 31st of that fiscal year could be uh, reimbursed or back paid. And we do have um, some financial reporting for the program. Um, all gaming grant funding must be reported in the gaming account summary report, otherwise known as the Gasser. So organizations that receive gaming grants or have previously received the grant and still have money in their gaming account must submit a Gasser. And that has to be submitted within 90 days of your organization's fiscal year end. And the Gasser just really details the, what's going on in the, the gaming account for the past year. So it shows the balance at the beginning of the fiscal year, um, any grants received that year, um, any funds that you've spent, and what the balance is at the end of the fiscal. As I mentioned, there is a new section that will capture um, grant funds that have been allocated to organizational costs. We've added that, so you'll see that start showing up on the Gasser. And we also have a section um, that requires a description of how the community benefited from the programs and services that were supported by the gaming grant funds. And um, I'll just also note that organizations must submit all recent gaming account summary reports in order to receive another community gaming grant or capital project grant. And the Gasser helps to ensure that grant funding is only uh, used on eligible expenses. So that's why we asked for that disbursement list. And we have a blank Gasser as well as a, a filled in example Gasser document uh, that's available on our website and uh, I, I believe a tutorial as well. So applying for the grant. So our intake periods for this year are up on the screen. As I mentioned, we do start off with um, arts and culture that will be opening up uh, in a few days time on February 1st. Following that, sport will open up on March 1st. Um, parent advisory councils and district parent advisory councils will open on April 1st. Uh, environment and public safety uh, both open on July 1st um, and as I mentioned the human and social services uh, is opening uh, a bit early again this year on June 1st but that will be changing to August 1st um, the following year. Um, we also have our capital project grants. We don't have the dates yet of when that will be open although it is typically in the summer um, so just keep your eyes peeled for that if that is a program that you are interested in. And we'll talk a bit more about that um, in detail in a couple minutes here. So applications must be done online using our website. Uh, we don't accept paper applications. Um, any documentation that is required must be um, attached uh, with the application at the time that you submit it or it can be emailed to us within two weeks of um, submitting the application. Um, before you apply, um, I mentioned that at the start, but definitely review the program guidelines, uh, as well as the resources on our website um, for valuable information and tips. Um, we've got all sorts of things like pre-application checklists, we've got sample um, financial documents, frequently asked questions, application tutorials, you name it. There's lots of information to help you uh, through the process. And I'll just mention too, um, if your application is denied um, or you'd like to request that the branch reconsiders their decision, you may file a reconsideration request. Um, it needs to be made within 30 days of the notification and it should state the reasons why the decision should be varied or overturned. Um, 
new information, documentation, and so on is not accepted. It is really just intended to look at the original application and make sure that um, the decision that was made was, was correct, there wasn't any errors or um, misinterpretations from the branches part. Um, and uh, it, final decision will be made uh, within 90 days of receiving the request. That's the, the service time we try and stick to. Sometimes uh, we may be a little delayed in that depending on um, staffing and, and other things, um, but we do try and stick to that time frame. So just a couple of tips uh, and advice for applying to leave off this section with. Um, again, read the most recent program guidelines. Uh, should answer most questions, if not all questions that you may have. Um, review the pre-application checklist. So that's just going to make sure that you've got all of those pieces ready to go. Um, and you can review the example documents on our website um, for each of those pieces. Uh, if possible or relevant, you can have a professional review your financials just to make sure those are all in good order. Um, any documentation that you would need to uh, provide with the application, uh, make sure it's in the right format, a Word or PDF uh, for easy upload. And if there are any questions that you come across that you haven't been able to answer, um, give us a call, send us an email. Uh, we do have someone available every day to answer questions. If you've applied previously um, and there were items that needed to be addressed, um, it helps if you can, um, well, first of all, resolve them. But second, um, if you need to, you can write a little cover letter um, that, that outlines the steps that you've taken to address the issues. Um, as I mentioned, uh, having that gaming account summary report submitted is essential, so make sure that that's been done. And the, the last piece is that um, as we mentioned, we do have uh, intake windows that are open for several months. Um, if you can and it works for your organization, try to apply as early as possible. We do um, process them in the order that they are received. So you'll, you'll get an answer earlier, basically. Okay, so I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about the Capital Projects Grant Program. Uh, we typically do have a whole separate other webinar on this um, that happens before that grant opens. So, um, you know, if you're interested in that, just keep an eye on our website and that would be um, published. Uh, 2021, uh, the year that just passed, that was our fifth year of the program. Um, the intake is closed now, um, but information for next year will be forthcoming, as I mentioned. Um, as I said earlier, the objective of this grant is really around enabling not-for-profits to complete uh, larger capital projects, uh, always with the intention of benefiting communities. Um, it's specifically for projects that have a total cost of between 20,000 to 1.25 million. Um, we are strict on that amount. Uh, we're, we're looking to fund projects that are within the scope of a not-for-profit organization. So, we're not looking to fund multi-million dollar projects um, that are, are kind of outside of that community organization range. Um, the sectors for our main program are also applicable here. So uh, if you're looking to apply for a grant, you would also need to fall under one of those six sectors that I mentioned earlier. Um, and our organization eligibility is the same as the regular community gaming grant program. Um, for this program, we will fund between 20 and 50% of the total cost of a project. Uh, the percentage really depends on the cost of the project and the total grant amount. Um, I'll talk a bit about that in a second. Uh, but we provide grants that are up to a maximum of $250,000. So uh, to give you an example of how the, the percentage of what we will fund works out, Say you have a, a, pro, a project that's at the top of that range, so it's 1.25 million, but we can only provide a maximum of $250,000. Well, that works out to 20% of funding. So basically, if your, your project is smaller, would be able to fund more of that project. Uh, we do require matching funds from the applicant organization, uh, and these must be on hand at the time of your application. Um, 
you may have a bona fide commitment, um, but I would say that funding in hand is always a stronger case for your application because we know it's there um, and ready to go. And the other thing I'll mention is that um, successful applicants will get what they've applied for. Um, so if you tell us your project is going to cost X amount of dollars and you need X amount of dollars to complete it, that is the amount that you will receive because we want to make sure that we are funding the completion of projects. And the last thing that I'll mention that is different about this grant, um, because we only have $5 million to, to go around, it is an assess a competitive assessment process. So applicants are definitely encouraged to put forward their strongest application, knowing that um, it is quite competitive and, and all the other applicants are also putting their best foot forward. So as I mentioned, uh, we don't have the intake period for 2022 um, established just yet. It does typically happen in the summer. So um, just keep that in the back of your mind um, and keep checking back on our website um, for when those dates have been uh, solidified. Um, the other part is that uh, organizations can only submit one application per year for one project. Um, so we're, we're looking to fund just one project, not phases of projects or like a cascading project. Um, and there should only be one lead in the application or project. Um, you can certainly work with and get the support of other organizations, um, but one organization has to assume responsibility for the entire project, um, both financial and otherwise responsibility. Um, and that has to be clear in the application. Um, organizations can still apply for the regular community gaming grant. Um, these programs are considered separate. So when I say things like one application per year, I'm just talking about the capital project grant. Um, and like our regular guidelines, uh, the capital project program has its own sector guide um, and that is updated each year. So that, we'll go through that process again this year. Um, for project eligibility criteria for the program, there's kind of three, three different buckets. Um, as I mentioned, we do only accept one grant application per applicant for one project. So applicants can only apply for one of these categories. Um, you could apply for uh, a bunch of building renovations, but you couldn't also apply for um, a fleet of vehicles. You have to pick one project that you want to complete. Um, because the point is for us to be helping with the successful completion of a total project um, rather than a bunch of half completed projects. So the three different buckets, uh, we've got facilities. So this would be about constructing new facilities, renovating or maintaining existing facilities. This could include purchasing new or used buildings uh, or facilities. Um, doing renovations, installing like an HVAC system, elevators, um, lighting, things of that sort. The other bucket is community infrastructure, and that's to develop public amenities that improve uh, BC residents' quality of life. So these are typically kind of on um, uh, public lands or, or publicly shared assets. So things like playgrounds, um, outdoor structures, community spaces, skate parks, um, trails. Um, and ecosystem restoration. And finally, acquisitions, that would be to purchase fixed capital assets for long-term ownership and use by the applicant organization. So some examples would be vehicles, um, computer or IT systems, um, any sort of technical equipment required by your organization, um, sports equipment even, um, and in some cases, boats. Uh, and the other thing I'll just mention, you know, all the examples here hopefully make that clear, but we're looking to fund hard assets. So we don't fund research or development. Um, and each project category has its own kind of uh, criteria that's specific to each of those buckets. Um, but generally speaking, they include things like making sure the project is for community benefit and will be accessible to the public once completed. Um, and particularly if we're talking about building, um, the organization has the right to build or modify land, um, and that's been demonstrated through proof of ownership or lease or, or some kind of um, appropriate permissions. 
So I mentioned it is a competitively assessed um, application. This is how we um, break down um, and assess the, the project applications. So 20% is allocated to community benefit. Um, and that's the, the, the part where you would tell us, you know, where the project, why it's needed um, and how the community will benefit. There's a section for inclusiveness and accessibility. So we're looking to see how many people will benefit and um, ensuring that it's open and inclusive to everyone. We have a section for project feasibility. So we're looking to see here that there is a, a, a solid plan in place to make sure that the project will start after funding is provided and then it can be completed on time. And I'll just mention here too that um, for successful applicants, the funding must be spent within 36 months of receiving it. Um, so that project timeline should show how the project would be completed in that time frame. Um, and also projects must start within 12 months of receiving the funding. Uh, we have quite a big portion that's dedicated to financial considerations. So not only do we want to see that there's a, a solid and viable plan, um, we want to see the solid numbers on the financial aspect. So we're looking to see things like the project's total cost and its budget, um, how the grant funds will be used toward eligible expenses, and that you do have those matching funds in place. Um, finally, there's a small portion uh, related to environmental efficiency. Um, this would cover things like climate or environment features to reduce energy or operational costs or emissions. Uh, this may not be applicable to all projects, and you can certainly note um, where this is not applicable and why. Okay, so that about wraps us up. I'm going to leave us off with some resources before we get into the Q&A part. Um, I've mentioned our website several times. Um, so here's the, the web address or where you would find all of the, the guidelines, documents, and all the other pieces that I mentioned. I also mentioned that we have a phone number that folks can call if they have questions. Um, so that's on the screen there too. Um, we've also got two um, email inboxes. We've got a general community gaming grants email for sort of general questions. Uh, as well as the community outreach manager, which is me. Um, if you have something that's a little more in depth or maybe you're looking to chat about um, a previous notification letter and some issues that were mentioned um, and you wanna have a, a sort of more lengthy and in-depth conversation about that. In addition, we've got the BC Association of Charitable Gaming who's here with us today. Um, they're also a wonderful resource. I know Kalina puts on lots of these uh, webinars throughout the year. Um, and they also assist organizations with applications and questions. Um, and similarly, we've got the BC Association of Aboriginal Friendship Centers. Um, they provide support specifically to Indigenous not-for-profit organizations, but they're a resource as well. And finally, I'll just mention the several different community charitable gaming associations in the province. Um, they're not in every community, but they do have a very wide reach. So if you are in any of these areas, uh, definitely recommend you reaching out to them. They provide the same level of support. Um, they can help with applications. They can provide uh, more in-depth assistance, answer questions, all those fun things. So um, at this point, I would like to thank everybody who is staying the calls with us for, for the two hours. And I would like also like to thank Denise um, Emery and Laurie for making this happen. And um, uh, BCACG and other CCGAs also have um, regular webinar, which talks about more or less the same thing for, for other people who cannot join today, or if you would like to join again, just to ask more questions or clarify some points, um, please stay tuned um, to all of our websites and, and we'll be, uh, you'll be able to, to join other webinar. Um, okay, so um, at this point, Denise, thank you so much, um, and Marie You're and Laurie as well. And um, I would just like to say goodbye to everybody, and um, we we'll have to see each other very soon. <laughs> thank you. Thanks for having me.